Well, welcome to the hills. To all of you watching online around the world right now, to all of you the next few days, the thousands of you that are going to listen to a podcast, or all of you in person if you're at West Fort Worth campus, Keller campus, or North Richmond Hills, I want to wish all of you a very happy new year. And I hope your new year has gotten off to a wonderful start. Mine has. Because last week, Jamie and I were privileged to be a part of a conference and a retreat for church planters, some of God's very best people on the front lines doing the hard, wonderful work of starting churches, mostly in unchurched cities. You can see here on uh, the first day, I did some teaching uh, at the conference on preaching. The next day, Jamie and I talked together about maintaining a balance between family and ministry. And like I said, there are about 25 couples and a, a great percentage of them are supported by our church. And so we took a picture of everybody and then I said, could I get a picture just of the couples that our church supports? And here they are, church. We're supporting these people as they plant churches. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Church planters love our church. In fact, people that weren't in the picture shouted, could we be supported by the hills? We want to be in the picture, too. Uh, it was a thrill to be with them. But now you could look at the picture and tell we're the oldest people in the picture. Jamie and I have entered a season of life where when we go to conferences, we're not so much peers as we are mentors. And that's okay. I'm fine. I, every part of my life can bring glory to God, and I'm fine with this season I'm in as I get older. I've told some of you, when I was in my 20s, I could play basketball all night, just get up the next day and go. And then I hit my 30s, and I could play basketball all night, but I'd wake up in the morning, and I was sore. And then I hit my 40s, and I would wake up in the morning, and I was sore. And I didn't do anything last night. Now I've hit a season of life where I can wake up in the morning and my neck hurts because I hurt myself sleeping. That's where I'm at. And that's okay. I don't resent that because the scripture is clear. Outwardly, we are wasting away. But the good news is the same verse says, but inwardly, we are being renewed day by day. But are we? Because it seems to me that many Christians are not doing, renewing very well. And over the last three years, especially as a pastor, nothing has burdened my heart more than to see all the Christians I know whose souls are tired and anxious and joyless. And the last thing they would want me as their pastor to pray over them is what Pastor John prayed over his friend. Look at the verse with me. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. Even as. Would you want someone to pray this prayer over you? Would you want me to pray right now? I hope everything else in your life, your finances, your job, your health, your kids, I hope they're doing as well as your soul is doing. And so for the next four weeks, I've got a series called Soul Fool. And hopefully we're going to be real honest and evaluate how are we doing. And today I'm going to ask you five important questions, and here's the first. Be honest. Is it well with your soul? Ask yourself right now, is it well with my soul? You see, God created us a body and a soul. Our soul is not just part of us. Our soul is in some ways the center of us. Our very being was made to be saturated with the being of God. And our soul is that part of us that God fills. And so David could say in Psalm 42, my soul thirst for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet with God? That soul was that part of him that was just longing for more communion with God. 
In Hebrew poetry, typically they would repeat themselves uh, with the second line being the same as the first, but with a different wording. So look at this next psalm. Praise the Lord, my soul. Same idea. All my inmost being. Praise his holy name. My soul is that deep inner part of me where I most intimately commune with God. Now, this is why the enemy is relentless in making war against our souls. So let me state the obvious, and let me state what has been my greatest burden as a pastor these last three years, that it seems more and more we live in a culture that has normalized a way of life that is absolutely toxic to our souls. And I think the evidence is all around us. The skyrocketing rates of anxiety and depression, the rising abuse of alcohol and opioids, the constant airing of offense and outrage and grievance. And maybe most of all, seeing people I know and love who seem like they are always exhausted on the inside and that this has become the new normal. And we keep telling ourselves, oh, this is just a season. No, it's not a season. It has become our lifestyle. We are living in ways that are costing us our souls. And when you lose your soul, you lose connection with God. And I know many Christians who would not want John's prayer prayed over them. Be honest, would you? Would you want everything else in your life right now to be as healthy as your soul. The good news is that Jesus understands and he offers something better. And perhaps the most beautiful invitation ever given, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. He's not just offering temporary relief. He's offering restoration. He's offering a better way to live that keeps our souls healthy. He's offering not just to be our savior for eternity. He's offering to be the shepherd of our daily lives. And and that calls to mind maybe the greatest song ever written. I know that's a bold claim, but when you've been on the top of the charts for 3000 years, you get to say that. Here's the song. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. And so, for the next four weeks, can I ask you to be really, really honest? Is it well with your soul? I remind you of the words of two of history's greatest philosophers. Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. And Ice Cube said, you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. (laughs) And so I'm going to ask you some questions this morning, and I want you to check yourself. Here's the next. Is my soul undernourished? See, I believe much of the damage we are doing to our souls is self-inflicted. And it starts with the vacuous, the frivolous, and even poisonous diets we feed our souls. And let's get honest. A huge part of the problem are these dopamine dispensers that we keep in our pockets. So last summer on my sabbatical, the Lord convicted me. My soul cannot 
do life at the speed of my smartphone. My soul cannot absorb all the evil and the suffering and the pain and the hate and the anger in the world. All in one second. And it's not good for my soul to be sucked into all the vacuous distraction that this little dopamine dispenser offers me. And before you get testy, let me ask you a question. Have you ever one time, after 30 minutes scrolling on your phone, playing games, looking at the comments, following a rabbit trail of memes and videos, have you ever one time after 30 minutes of scrolling said, I feel so much closer to God now. Our souls are overgorged and undernourished, and they cannot rest. We're like sheep. Sheep can't rest until they're full. And so it is the task and job of a shepherd to make sure that the sheep have a diet that will truly nourish them. And our shepherd has done that. Again, the psalmist says, the law of the Lord is perfect refreshing the soul. God says, I can provide a diet that's good for your soul. And so one of the things God convicted me about this past summer was I'm going to be more intentional about what I feed my soul. For example, and I'm not saying you should do this. I'm saying this is what I did. I had a Twitter account and it was big. For years, once a day, I've uh, tried to encourage thousands of people with a tweet. But it was not worth all the sewage I was having to wade through to do that. And so I deleted my account. And it has been good for my soul. And it seems to me the world seems to be going along just fine without me tweeting. (laughs) Another thing I've been convicted about is that I need to get more comfortable just being alone and quiet with God. I don't have to, every time I am get in a car, turn on a knob or hit a button. I can spend, and I have been spending that time just praying and listening to God. And it has been good for my soul. Augustine said that we must empty ourselves of all that fills us if we want to fill ourselves with that of which we are empty. So I'm just asking you, be honest. Is your current diet sufficient to sustain a healthy soul? Or is your soul undernourished? And is it possible my soul might be over anxious? You see, in David's day, there were lions and bears and wolves all around And sheep knew it. And that's why they were so restless. Sheep don't have sharp teeth or claws. The only thing a sheep can do when a predator approaches is run. That's why they're so skittish and always looking around and having a hard time resting. And like sheep, anxiety producing situations are not for us an occasional possibility. They are a constant reality. We cannot escape the fact the world is full of things to worry about. Do you know what the HarperCollins word of the year for 2022 is? Permacrisis. That we live in a world where there is always one huge crisis stacked on top of another. Think of the last three years. Pandemic. Political instability. War in Ukraine. Racial tension. Inflation. Climate change. And these things aren't going away. And you can never manage and manipulate life to eliminate the potential for stress. Just like a sheep can't live where there aren't wolves and lions. The only thing that could calm the sheep down in that world was that he knew he was in the presence of his shepherd. Jesus said, come to me, 
All you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. So, could it be behind so much of our soul weariness is the admission that we have functionally stopped coming to Jesus? And when we get anxious and stressed and burnt out, we go to Netflix or a video game, or the gym, or a bottle. And we just keep maintaining the lifestyle that frustrates the restoration of our soul. About 20 years ago, there were three fishing boats all in the space of about two weeks that sank off the coast of New England. Ten men died. The interesting thing is that none of the boats had a breach in the hull. They were all captained by veteran sailors. They were all on their way back home. You see, these boats had these clam traps that weighed 300 pounds. But when you fill them with clams, these traps weigh 1,000 to, uh, to a ton and a half. And they had 10 more traps on their boats than they were supposed to have. How did that happen? Well, that's where the industry was going. You see, someone figured out, we could put one more trap on our boat and make a little bit more money. If we put five more traps, we'd have a lot more profit. And so it just became normal for these boats to have 10 to 15 tons more weight on them than they were meant to carry. And what was just accepted as normal proved to be fatal. Jesus is saying, you don't have to live the way you've been living. What you're calling normal doesn't have to be how it is. I am inviting you to a way of life that will restore your soul. The scripture pleads in Psalm 116, return to your rest, my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. 2023 does not have to be like the last three years. We can live a new normal. Jesus is offering us a way to save our souls. If that's what we want. But have you ever said you want something, but deep down you knew you weren't going to make the changes because you didn't want it bad enough? So, I never learned to like coffee. When I was a young man, if I needed a caffeine kick, I'd buy a Dr. Pepper. But as you will learn, as you get older and your metabolism slows down, I couldn't handle all the sugar. So, I taught myself to like Diet Coke. Don't you judge me. (laughs) And I will confess, I was drinking too much Diet Coke. I made it a resolution. I need to drink less Diet Coke. For lots of reasons. For one, I don't know if you've heard recent studies said there could be a connection between diet soda and short-term memory loss. For years, there's been some studies suggesting there might be a link between artificial sweeteners and some kinds of cancer. There's no way all that carbonation and caffeine in my body every day is good for me. Oh, and I don't know if you heard, there's been a recent study that said there could be a connection between diet soda and short-term memory loss. And so I decided... <laughs> that I would drink less Diet Coke. And I'm going to be honest as your pastor and confess, I still drink too much Diet Coke. I want it, but I guess I just don't want it enough. Is that what you're doing to your soul? Listen to the words of Jeremiah. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. We will not do what we need to do to bless our souls. Like children resisting a nap, so many Christians fight the very thing they need. So here's the hardest question I'm going to ask today. Am I willing to do what it takes to care for my soul? 
Now, let me be clear. Only Jesus can save my soul for eternity. But I must partner with Jesus to save my soul from infirmity in this present life. And yet very few Christians have a conscious plan for taking care of their souls. Instead, we lie to ourselves. We naively cling to the illusion, well, this is just a season. I'll get past this season and my soul will get better. Or, well, I just need some more time. Can I be honest? You ain't getting more time. God gives you 24 hours a day and that's not changing. You don't need more time. You need to use the time God has given you differently. In other words, we need to accept the yoke of Jesus. See, here's the thing. You cannot have the life of Jesus without the lifestyle of Jesus. If I said, do you believe that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life? Most of you would agree with me. But we think he's the truth more than we think he's the way. And so we believe what he says more than we're willing to live like he lived. Could you imagine a stressed out Jesus? Could you imagine Jesus ever saying to anybody, I'm sorry, but I'm just too fried right now. I don't have what it takes to love you right now. You say, well, he's God. Yes, but he was fully man. And when you read the Gospels, you see Jesus intentionally engaging in practices that nourished his soul. The next several weeks, we're going to talk about what some of these practices are. But I'm going to give you a, a preview right now. One of them was sleep. Jesus knew God made us to need sleep. Jesus could sleep even on a boat in a storm if his body said it's time to sleep. By the way, the light switch here has really messed us up. Do you know before Edison, the average person slept 11 hours a day? Because it was dark at home. Yeah, you read that they would get up at four in the morning and pray, but they went to bed at six o'clock. Here's the thing. In scripture, the psalmist says sleep is an act of faith. Sleeping is not only taking care of my body and my soul, but it's saying, God, you've got this. You're in charge. You're on the throne. I can rest and you can run the world. Another practice of Jesus was the deliberate pursuit of silence. We often saw, see Jesus in the gospel seeking solitary places to pray and to recover. He sent his disciples on their first big mission. He knew when they, they came back, they'd be tired. Look what he said in Mark 6. Come with me by yourselves to notice a quiet place. And get some rest. Do you believe it is important to create margin in your life for God? Because here's what I believe about most of you. You really do love God. But many of you don't prioritize making time just to be with God. And your soul's suffer because of your constant exposure to noise and to rush. And then finally, Jesus was intentional about the practice of Sabbath. In fact, the whole sermon next week is going to be about this, and you have no excuse to absences. You all need to hear what the Bible says about God's gift of Sabbath. One thing this meant for Jesus is that it was a rhythm of his life. Every single week, he gathered with other believers and publicly worshiped God. He did this because it was good for his soul. But Jesus understood that when it says the Sabbath 
was made for man. That it, it wasn't just talking about a day, it was talking about an orientation. That God's gift of rest is what we need to flourish. See, Sabbath reminds us we are not what we do. Your value next week is not determined by how much you crank out and produce. Your value is determined by who you are loved by. Sabbath calls on us to embrace our limits and to accept the reality that this world and the people you love do not depend on your activity, but on God's. And that's hard for a prideful person to accept. I came to this church as a young man over 30 years ago. The church was in a crisis. It had a debt crisis. There was very real doubt it was going to make it. I had a young family. I was busy. And after I'd been here a few months, I was diagnosed with mononucleosis. I had never had that in my life. All I remember was I was extremely fatigued. And the doctor said, the only thing you can do is rest. And it made me mad. I'm too important to rest. My family needs me. My church needs me. I need to be doing things. I need to be making things happen. And God rebuked me. And God said to me, I had Fort Worth under control before you got here. Take a nap. (laughs) You see, we live in an age where it is possible to always be at work. And again, these dopamine dispensers are part of the problem. The current paradigm and expectation is you should be available 24-7. If I want you, I want you to think about something. Which commandment of the 10 will Christians applaud you if you break? Think about your job. Think about my job. Could I remain your pastor if I cheated on my wife and committed adultery? Could I remain your pastor if I got angry and killed somebody? Could I remain your pastor if I consistently lied to you? But I can work myself to the bone. I can fry my spirit with constant frenetic activity. And I will be applauded by Christians for my output. And you will at your job too. It's the one command Christians will celebrate you breaking. Some of you are thinking, well, pastor, the devil never takes a day off. Well, he's the devil. I don't think the goal is to be more like him. Listen, these last few years have been hard on us. And I know your souls are worn out. But the lie some of you are believing is there's a quick fix out there. If I could just go on a retreat or have a worship encounter. Or maybe hire a life coach or get some therapy. And all these things are good. But there is no quick fix to restoring your soul. What Jesus is calling us to do is to intentionally build the kind of life that is good for our souls. A life that has rhythms that make room for God. And if we build it, He will come because He wants to fill us. Please notice, Jesus did not say, learn about me. He said, learn from me me. He's not offering escape. He's offering equipment. He's offering a yoke. What he's offering is to teach us a way to do life that keeps our souls healthy. And so let me get really candid. 
This has been my burden for several years. And last summer, I really began to pursue the Lord about what to say to my church about it. And I told my wife back in July of 2022, here's my concern. I'm going to stand up in January and I'm going to say, it's important to take care of our souls. And 100% of my church is going to say, I agree with you. And then in over four weeks, I'm going to show my church some things that we could change and do to take better care of our souls. And 98% of my church are going to say, those are good things. But then only a small percentage of the people who listen to me are going to do anything differently. Because we have just accepted as normal the way that we do life, even though it is killing our souls. And here's an important thing to remember about your soul. It will not scream at you if you ignore it, at least not right away. The outer world will scream at you. The outer world will always ask for more of your attention. And the great lie is believing if I could just improve my scorecard in the outer world, then I will have more peace and joy in my inner world. And Jesus disagrees. In fact, maybe the most important question ever asked is this one from Jesus. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? And what if Jesus isn't just talking about your eternal destiny? What if he's talking about the way you do life right now? And so I close then with this question. What have I really won if I lost my soul? In the process. Can it really be considered a success if it seduced me from the cultivation of my soul? That part of me that connects with God. Dallas Willard said, the most important thing is not what you do. It's who you become that's what you will take into eternity. You see, on the great exam, there's going to be these two big questions. Did you become someone that passionately loved God? Did you become someone who could consistently love people? And we cannot love well when our souls are depleted and weary. The gospel show us over and over that Jesus said, you can't love and always be in a hurry. In fact, it's interesting, the metaphor he used in his Sermon on the Mount, when he talked to people so fried and so exhausted and so worn out with worry and anxiety, and he said, why? The pagans run after all these things. Why are you living a life where you're just always running? He's calling us to model a different way to live. Because he knows the world needs the witness of people with rested, healthy, non-anxious souls. Because here's the thing. Non-Christians don't read Bibles. Non-Christians read Christians. And the real win is when they notice it is well with our souls. And so here's a good resolution for the new year. Be more soul full. Be in a place 
where you want someone to pray over you. I hope everything else in your life is doing as well as your soul is doing. I read recently about a guy named Bob Davey who died just two years ago in England at the age of 91. He and his wife found a church in the countryside near their home in great need of repair. It had been desecrated by Satanists. And Bob made it his life mission the last 22 years of his life to restore this church called St. Mary's. And did a good job. He brought back to life a place that was sacred. A place where people could commune with God. In fact, inside the church, they found some paintings of Bible stories a thousand years old. Let that sink in. 800 years before we said, remember the Alamo, these pictures were bringing glory to God. What Bob did for a church, Jesus wants to do for you. So listen again to the best song ever. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. This is the invitation Jesus is offering for people who are ready to stop calling normal what is killing them and take his yoke. So this year, Is it going to be more of the same? Or are you going to let Jesus save your soul? Pray with me, please. Oh, God, give us ears to hear the things we really need to hear. Give us the courage to change the things that we really need to change. Because we hope if not today, then soon, a dear friend could pray over us. I hope everything in your life is doing as well as your soul. It's hard, Jesus. The last few years have been really hard. So please come, restore our souls. For your glory and we pray in your name, amen.